so good evening everyone so today we are going to speak about something which is quite a lot relevant to us in the sense a lot of times they do tend to miss they may be having some pain especially in their limbs and all so a lot of times and then when we try to do ultrasound doppler and all for that that is the time when we tend to realize that okay that person may be having what is called as a deep vein thrombosis so what can we do what can we how can we uh, give that person a better quality of life so that is what we are going to discuss about it. So as I already said, it, this is more of a venous uh, uh, thrombus burden due to which that problem is happening. So as we can see it over here, it's not a regional problem. So which is not just present in one of one of you of the countries. It is more like a, a global problem. So even if we'll try to see just in Europe, nearly half million deaths are happening. So due to just a single cause. So even in uh, countries like uh, US and all, if we will try to see, there is a quarter million, quarter million of deaths which is happening. So even in other uh, regions as well, the the morbidity, the mortality which is associated with such a problem is quite a lot high. In fact, that is one of the reasons uh, when they try to see that, uh, what about the diagnosis? How often is it does get uh, delayed in fact? So they try to see in a master registry in which which had enrolled like 2000 patients and when they try to see in fact they saw there's a huge delay so for example it's not just a problem which is there in uh, less educated countries or undeveloped or developing countries but even in the developed countries as well it is a big problem in fact so delayed diagnosis it does happen even in those countries and we are always concerned about what about the quality of life for the patient so what happens is it does get affected in a very negative way in so much so that those patients will be complaining that it not only affects their daily life but also those patients are having emotional distress it tends to affect their psychology and in fact on an overall basis it is uh, indeed a life-changing event life-changing event because it tends to affect their daily life day-to-day life as well uh, we all are always bothered about the economy how about the financial burden for that so even for this problem as well the financial burden is quite a lot for example in US it goes up to nearly 20 to 30 billion dollars similarly even in US as well uh, or UK for example when we will talk it is nearly half billion uh, dollar in fact so what are we trying to do whenever we are thinking for this kind of problem is we are trying to of course prevent complications and also prevent its recurrence and similarly at the same time we are trying to treat that as well so the uh, when it comes to the management part it is more of a three tire system three tire system why i'm trying to tell is first of all you have to confirm your diagnosis it is really venous thromboembolism then in the meantime you have to try to think for is the acute care and finally that is the time when it comes is you have to discharge the patient and also try to educate that patient as well that if they are going to try to take care of all these precautions the further recurrences and all are not going to happen so now trying to see what are the steps which is involved so the initial step being a physician is always this physical examination okay so let's not forget our basics so in that first of all you should try to always rule out or exclude the is there any other diagnosis as well for example is there any similar likelihood of cellulitis okay is there any other uh, there any evidence of trauma or there's baker cysts or for example uh, you know uh, one of the important things i would really like to stress upon what is called as the wells score okay so the wells score uh, we'll try to show again in detail it is depend upon the pain tenderness the swelling the edema okay so those uh, the uh, I think in pathology as well we all had read RT LCD Ruber tuber uh, loss of function yes exactly so it is similar to that in fact and we'll see out further similarly the next thing comes is rule out pulmonary embolism how to rule about that is we'll have to see one of the always the important things is the heart rate is going to be increased for those patients okay we will also have to see if those patients are having any chest pain similarly um, as I already said it, you have to also try to think for the differential diagnosis. Differential diagnosis is always important that we should be able to know what are the other possible problems as well which those patients are happening. 
So for example, once the DVT diagnosis is confirmed, we should try to identify what is the possible cause for that, okay? That did it happen due to any air travel or even due to uh, OCDs, OCPs as well, contraceptive pills in fact, or otherwise, is there any uh, history of cancer? So that is also one of the other already uh, recognized factor uh, which has been associated with thromboembolic uh, phenomena. So that is why, which I was talking about the score no. So this is one of the scores which can be used. So they try to give mostly a plus one score if someone is having all these uh, symptoms like the cancer, paralysis, bedridden, swollen leg or calf swelling. However, if uh, there is already a cause which is as likely as DVT, so you can give a score of minus two and then on the basis of that you try to calculate. Of course, if the score is more than one, DVT is likely and after that you have to do is a D-dimer test and uh, you can see is it positive or negative and on the basis of that you can ask for an ultrasound which is further helpful. So now coming to the management, so a lot of those patients will be coming to us in the ER emergency rooms. So that is the time we have to ask for the patient's history and also do a physical examination, get the blood tests done and also that is the time when we have to start thinking about the treatment selection. So shall we ask them for hospital admission or for the discharge and follow up as well. So uh, whenever we are planning for the discharge and follow up, some of the things is which is very important as I already said it is prescription, the medicine what we are going to prescribe them. Then the communication. Communication is always important that, you know, how are we going to teach them? The education is also a very important part because we want to prevent the recurrence, the complication as well. Similarly, we should plan a regular follow-up for them. So what uh, in West, what we used to have is called as the uh, anticoagulation clinics, otherwise DVT clinics as well in the West we used to have. I, I, I don't see much often over here in this region, but these are the newer things I would really suggest. So in fact, uh, the problem is uh, the traditional medications are there like the vitamin K antagonists. However, the, there are, they, uh, they do have their own limitations. So what are their limitations is they do take a lot of time. Okay, so they, uh, for the onset of action, so for example from 24 to 96 hours and that is the reason they have to be done with a, what is called as a bridging therapy. Bridging therapy in the, uh, with the usage of low molecular weight heparin or all these kind of things and that is why whenever we try to give all these medications and all so okay there should be a nurse or some uh, medical professional as well who can give those injections so that is why a lot of times it becomes a slightly more inconvenient to the person as well we should also try to think from the perspective of the patient as well so that is why in uh, 2016 ACCP American College of Chest Physicians guidelines were there which tends to give a clear preference for new oral anticoagulants. So if you will try to look over the uh, grade of recommendation, for example, so we can already see, uh, so NOACs are preferred compared to the vitamin K antagonist or even the low molecular weight heparin. And the grade of recommendation is 2B in fact. And one of the other important things is, what about the, uh, how long should it be given? So the 1B uh, level of recommendation is at least around three months, okay? It will also further depend upon the etiology. Etiology will be is, for example, is it a provoked DVT or unprovoked? So what is the difference in between both of them is, provoked DVT is, for example, if there is a, uh, you know, there is an active cancer, otherwise there is a history of surgery, all those kind of things will be provoked, okay? Or there is a transient risk factor, in fact. So uh, there are various uh, new oral anticoagulants which is available in front of us, like the rivaroxaban, apixaban, and uh, Davigatron as well. How, so we all already aware how do they target. Their target is definitely different. For example, Davigatron is the one which tends to, they are anti-thrombin. However, Apixaban and Rivaroxaban is anti-10A in fact. So the uh, one of the problems which is associated with Davigatron is low bioavailability. That is one of the reasons we have to give the patient a pretty higher dosage higher dosage up to like 150 milligrams in fact. So that is the reason. So for example, river oxaban has a pretty good high oral bioavailability in the terms of nearly 80%. And that is why, so you can do well with like 50 to 20 milligrams as well. 
and the renal clearance is like 33 percent and that is why uh, he already suggested and shared the information it, the the uh, dosage which will have to change for the renal compromised patients is not much in fact okay and the best thing with of course with this molecule is od dosage so this was the overlapping uh, treatment which i already said it and the other thing is of course you can try to do a switch over therapy okay trying to switch from the low molecular weight heparin to the dabigatrin otherwise to the edoxaban so which we have already covered with some of those studies otherwise the newer trend which has it, it is already in existence which is very patient friendly as well that you can start in immediately for example of aliroxaban three week loading dose immediately and immediate action is there as well no need for any bridging therapy similarly for apixaban as well which was further proven by amplified study in fact now coming to the single drug uh, study which i was already telling you in fact what happens is most of the patients who come with the dvt they don't need any uh, hospitalization and no one would like to uh, why to spend extra money on the hospitalization and those are the things uh, okay which is very important so just with a single drug you can manage no need for those pricks and all for that even i don't like a prick okay so that's why so these options are available so as i was already telling in 21st century we always try to believe what is called as evidence based medicine that is the one which should be practiced so even in this it has been proven there are several studies so for example when they try to compare the river oxaban versus inoxaparin okay so we can see clearly over here the onset of action is pretty much almost similar and that is why when they try to see as well just within two hours you are giving a low molecular weight happening like inoxaparin or river oxaban as well within two hours itself you start seeing a good therapeutic uh, action in fact so yes uh, there are uh, two both sides of a coin as well there are some problems as well associated with it like the other anticoagulants like bleeding can be a risk for this similarly but we always need to do the balancing act as well uh, you know what about the side effects what about the good effects as well so on the basis of that you should try to see for that so that is why a careful selection of the patient and the drug and dose selection as well it is very important and that is why we should also try to see what about those modifiable risk factors modifiable risk factors as well why i said it like this uh, you know those associated factors and all which could be associated as i was telling some of those drug intakes as well which could be predisposing so you should be able to tell but this itself is another big topic you know uh, for the bleeding uh, management so we will not try to discuss too much about it but simple measures of withhold the drug if there is already a, a you know a counteracting drug as well for that okay you can always use it in fact so this is the flow chart which is already available so you again you have to classify them on the basis of mild moderate severe bleeding in fact and then uh, you have to manage then um, uh, this is the basics so it is a factor anti 10a inhibitor uh, which has already been shown so some of the studies which uh, tried to focus upon the river oxaban was einstein dvt and einstein pe so dvt of course is for the deep vein thrombosis and the pe is for pulmonary embolism so what happened is in these studies when they try to see if we can see it clearly so in river oxaban especially for the dvt the major bleeding risk is percentage wise is pretty minimum so like almost 0.8 percent only in fact similarly in the einstein dvt uh, study as well when they try to see for the primary efficacy outcome when they try to compare low molecular weight happening versus river oxaban so what was happening is even the number of patients who were at the relative risk was pretty low so that is why uh, as already it was said so for example initially for the three weeks 15 milligram bd dose should be given and later on which can be switched to 20 milligram just once daily but as i already said it you should also try to see for the renal clearance renal clearance in the sense so for example if it is less than 15 you should not use it okay and uh, if it is 15 to 29 use it with caution so that is why as i already said it yes we always have to outweigh that 
is it going to benefit the patient or not what about the modifiable risk factors if they are going to they will be there just take them out in fact and so now to summarize so as i already said it so what happens is especially for the risk of venous thromboembolism the risk is pretty high in the first 3 to 4 weeks okay after the dvt or the pulmonary embolism event has already happened so that is why we should try to take uh, to uh, take care to give good quality of anticoagulation and uh, so for example what happens is uh, whenever we are giving a oral vitamin k antagonist like uh, warfarin and all so if you are not maintaining a good therapeutic level problems will happen recurrence will also happen so that is why we should <coughs> try to take care and give them a good medication <coughs> and that is why even after a decade so what happens is yes the risk of venous thromboembolism is also happening so a lot of uh, difference is there between the theory and the practical so same thing happens in, even in the uh, you know the differences between the clinical trials versus the real world settings and so much so that, that as i was telling you in the clinical trials yes there's strict inclusion criteria exclusion criteria there's a fixed protocol okay you know there are event rates as well which are set up however in the real world unselected patients are going to be the the dose recommendations and all so that's why uh, they try to do another prospective non-interventional study which is called as zalia okay so in which they try to have a similar primary outcome bleedings however for the patient with acute dvt okay and they were given uh, the anticoagulant therapy for at least more than or at least minimum was three months in fact so it was a pretty global trial however they included most of the patients from european countries canada and israel and they saw that uh, uh, there were very very fewer recurrences the uh, the rate of major bleeding was pretty less and in fact uh, the results were pretty much similar to the einstein dvt study which was already done and we showed as well and the best thing was whenever you are going to give this unique medication to those patients they don't require hospitalization much so thank you so much if there are any questions i'll be happy to answer